We founded the Oslo Women's Rights Initiative last year to bring women activists together in collaboration and solidarity. This is crucial for collective movements that can effectively create change in the region through unity. Unity also includes solidarity and support. So sitting here this evening and listening to the stories of these incredible women helps create change as well. So thank you for being here this evening. Before I hand over the stage um, to these incredible women, Oslo Women's Rights Initiative could not have grown without the solidarity and support of our sport, uh, sponsors and our collaborators. So we're very, very extremely grateful to the Norwegian civil society organizations and leaders who have lent their support in this important initiative. Thank you to the Nobel Peace Center, Civita, and Frit Urd for helping make tonight possible. And thank you to the generosity of individuals such as Ingrid Stange, Jan Vardun and Villa Paradiso, Noah's Ark Catering, the Oslo Media House, and Otto Calvo, who are lending space and resources to a private workshop that follows this evening. We are very proud and pleased to continue doing this every year and growing. And I encourage you to also tweet about our event tonight. We have a hashtag OWRI2019, Oslo Women's Rights Initiative acronym. And on, on Facebook, if you go to the Oslo Women's Rights Initiative Facebook page, we have our live streaming as well. And I encourage you to share it with your Facebook friends so they can also tune in. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mariam. And I'd like to thank you for coming to our house for this uh, event. We're all very proud and feel very, very honored to, to be host, hosting this event. Um, our next speaker, the next voice we will be listening to, uh, belongs to Saina Erheim. She's an award-winning journalist from Syria. Okay, we're not going to listen to her first. <laughs> But that's okay. But that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we will listen to Asadi Pursan. She is born and bred uh, a human rights activist. Actually, uh, she grew up uh, with the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Shirin Ebadi as a house guest, and uh, actually, she will be sharing her personal story. Uh, with you uh, tonight, and that is uh, her first time. And we are really honored and privileged to be your first uh, audience, Asade. Welcome, stage is yours. Good evening. It's an honor to be here. Not many people could say that they began political action and they were exposed to it before they remember, but I can. I was two years old um, when my father was arrested before my eyes. I don't remember, but the story goes that I had high fever for a few days and I began to stutter as I was starting to speak. So my mom had to work on my speech for many months. But the worst part of it was that when my father um, returned home after a few months, Apparently, I didn't recognize him. I had no idea he was my father. I was scared of him. And so he had to reintroduce himself to me, and that took a while. Um, late, years later, when we would talk about it, it was, it was um, always this running joke that how did, you know, I would ask him, I said, you, 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 you impressed me the first time we met, but I don't know how you managed to impress me the second time we met. And so that was, that was childhood early on. When I was 14, I went to see my mother at the Islamic Revolutionary Court in Tehran. She was a human rights activist, a human rights lawyer, and it was her first arrest. She was on the wrong side of justice this time. I remember when I walked into the Revolutionary Court, I was struck by everything around me. All my senses were very much active, the sense of you know, the, the queues of, of prisoners that were waiting in long lines, waiting for their trials to begin, their sessions to begin, the insults that I could hear the soldiers um, were saying to the prisoners, the crying mothers of, of prisoners, the crying sisters, fathers, the begging. 
And um, I, I was very much overwhelmed by what I saw. That when I came home, I, I wrote... Um, I wrote in my journal, as I used to, about the impressions that I had, and the troublemaker activist journalist that my father was um, took my writing and had it published in a reformist newspaper in Iran. The next, the next day, I was, became famous. <laughs> I suddenly, overnight, became an influential voice at age 14, and I had to talk about my mother's situation in prison, and by way of that, I began to sort of look around me and, and see a lot of the injustice. And I, I began to talk more in general about the situation of others in my mother's shoes, um, and so on. So, you know, things change really fast. And also at home, I had started to be a little bit less of the youngest child of the household and more, um, if you will, the caregiver of, of a, a very strong woman who was my mother, and a very strong man who was my father. Uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer uh, because she was deprived of medical care when she was in prison. Um, and my father was just very emotional about everything that was happening around us. Um, and so that is how I feel I, I joined my parents in their struggle for human rights uh, in Iran. Um, it was in some ways a choice, in some ways not, but whatever it was, um, I just felt like I was, I was one of them, and, and uh, it wasn't about anymore being a child of, of, a, of a human rights activist or not, it was that we were in it together, and um, we were going to fight for whatever that is right. I remember when my mom was in prison, um, I got a phone call from a friend of hers uh, telling me that we have two hours to pack a bag for her, in, um, a, a, like a prison bag for her. I remember she called me and she said, Azadejan, um, we have two hours to pack a bag for your mom. No sharp uh, objects, uh, no pillows, maybe a blanket and the basics. And so um, that was the moment where I felt I could not take it anymore. I realized um, maybe this is maybe this means that she's actually in prison to stay. Maybe this is just gonna how this is gonna be how it is, and um, you know the the strong, stubborn, rebellious teenager that I was. I really broke down when I was packing that bag for her, um, not knowing when it was gonna last for how long it was going to last and when it was going to end. It was really a true limbo. And I think my senses were right in that it lasted forever. Even though she came out of prison in, within two months, that our story continued for many, many years and our struggle continued for many years. Um, and so I, I just want to also say that my mom was in prison um, because she had attended a conference in Berlin um, talking about the prospects of the reform movement in Iran. And then she came back is when sh her arrest had happened. Um, you know, when I think about my life in the past, many, you know, 34 years, I always remember those two months that she was in prison because something happened in me. Something happened really deep. I think an activist was born in me, and I tried really hard <laughs> to subdue that activist for many years, thinking that I have to move on, I have to find my own battle to fight. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't, you know, the, the activist in me remained and resisted and persisted and, and continued. And, um, and so sometimes in this very strange way, I, I guess uh, I have to thank the repression of the Islamic Republic for the fact that it, it, it created an activist in me. There was just so much injustice happening to the people I love that, that it changed me forever. <laughs> During the time when my mom was in prison, something else happened. I learned to campaign. I learned to campaign for my mother's freedom. My father and I would, you know, day in and day out, would joined together and would use any sense of activism and journalism to raise awareness about her situation and to ask for her freedom. We had so many disagreements, we had so many arguments, differences of approach, but it didn't matter. At the end, we managed. And I had, my sister in Canada would, would take on the international uh, aspect of the campaign, and, and the three of us worked like a machine, and we truly campaigned for her freedom. 
Unfortunately, years later, we had to repeat that same campaign, this time for the freedom of my father, who was arrested and kidnapped and arrested for the third time. And this time with my mother seeking the freedom of her husband. But you know, in all of this, in its very strange way, laughter was the way to go, making fun of ourselves, making fun of everything around us, the peculiarity of the things that were happening around us. Um, there were dark years in many ways. Um, there were the, chain, the years of the chain murderings of intellectuals. I had our, our family friends, my parents' friends, stabbed in their home in Tehran, shot in Europe, um, and assassinated allegedly by the forces of the Islamic Republic. My parents' names were on the lists that were coming out um, by anonymous sources of the intellectuals to be killed. We were in hiding and so on. But in all of that, when I look back, I remember that we were somehow always some, take, finding a refuge, finding a shelter in Tehran and spending the evening laughing and you know, eating and drinking and, and just joking. And, and so I think that, that's, what, that's the key to our survival. It was those stories and, and the ability to, to really see things for what they were and, and making fun of ourselves when we had to. I don't know why, but I never questioned my, my parents for what they were doing and for the risk that they, they, put, um, they were putting my, my sister and I in by the choices that they were making. Somehow, I had this feeling that they're right. Um, you know, they were fighting for things like women's rights, freedom of expression, rule of law, children's rights, you name it. And I had never lived in a place where those things existed truly, but they sounded nice. And um, it seemed that when we didn't have them in a place like Iran, things were scary like they were in my childhood. So I didn't see any reason why I shouldn't be there for them and support them. Um, I, I said all of this, but I want to emphasize that my childhood was a happy one. My youth was a happy one. Yes, it was complicated, but it was happy. I was a teen, I was a happy child. I was a, later on, I was a teenager, rebellious. I, um, I managed to have fun. I, I managed to, you know, uh, to do every mischievous thing that any teenager in the world can do. I fell in love, I fell out of love, I broke hearts, my heart was broken. When my parents were in, in prison, I still managed to go to school and have a few moments every day that I would forget about all the things that were happening at home. And it was just a simple teenager. Um, and I think that's what the world sometimes misses when we talk about countries like Iran. I think childhood and youth are probably the biggest threats against ideological machines like Iran. Um, and day in and day out, the, the ideological machine tries really hard to diminish the childhood, the smiles, the ability to have fun, and they fail each time. It's just incredible how, imp how, powerful, how powerful it is and how powerful we were as a child, as children, and how powerful today in Iran the Iranian youth and children are. And so, with all of this, I still, I still went to school that was run by an ideological um, system. Um, you know, we were told things like, um, uh, we were told things like, you know, if, if your parents violate the rules of this country, which they claim to be Islam, you would go to hell, your parents would go to hell. And even though I believed in what they were doing, I sometimes would secretly use whatever prayers that I had learned from school and pray for them so they don't end up in hell. And so was the contradiction. I lived in the contradiction. We lived in those contradictions. And we somehow managed to... I appreciated my parents for who they were. At the same time, I, I learned throughout the years to manage the fears that were instilled in me by the school or by the authorities. My parents remained in Iran for as long as they could. They had all the reasons to leave after the Islamic Revolution. They didn't. They stayed for many, many years, 20 or so years. My mother worked um, as a lawyer. But unfortunately, even the, the imprisonment, the torture, none of those things made them leave Iran. But what happened is that when my mother was arrested during her interrogations, she was being um, threatened. Um, 
uh, they used her being a mother to threaten me. They said that they will hurt her, her daughter. And this, was, this is what my, pushed my mom to the edge, and that's how we left Iran, my mother and I. And that's how gradually exile began, which is an, eter which is an eternal form of displacement, which is peculiar, and which is, uh, which is there to stay when you, like me, choose to not let go. Those were the, some of the stories that come to my mind when I, I, uh, when I think of my past. But really what, what pushed me to the edge in the end and what pulled me fully in was that my father, who was a journalist and was kidnapped and arrested um, and was under house arrest for many years, um, took his life in April 2011, uh, his own life in 2011 under house arrest. And... We couldn't be with him. We couldn't be with him those last years. If we, if we would go to Iran, we would get arrested. We were only allowed phone calls. Sometimes we would write him letters. And he was my best friend. Um, we were really best buddies. <laughs> we were partners in crimes. And um, somehow, during those years of separation, he managed to stay my best friend. I remember sometimes even you know, when I would get lost in the street, uh, streets of New York, I would call him, and because he had lived in New York for a little period of time, uh, many, months, uh, many years ago, he would try to navigate me through on the phone. We kept him alive by trying to connect, uh, keep him connected to our lives. But you can only endure so much. I went back to Iran in 2006. I was the only one, a member of my family, who, who could go and see him under house arrest. It was a very dangerous trip. I went there only for 10 days, and I had to go in for interrogation sessions, sometimes friendly, sometimes threatening. But my father was not happy that I went. He was angry, and he kept telling me, they will arrest you, they will not yet let you go. Even if they don't arrest you, they will take your passport away, your youth will be wasted, and I wish you had not come, my love. I had gone there to literally just give him a hug and to tell him that we're physically there for him and also to tell him that he should leave the country illegally, that he should spend his final years in peace and that we had arranged for him to leave illegally. But I remember he had this cane and he kept pushing on the ground and he said, I am going to stay here and I'm going to die here. I have worked and fought so hard for these people and this land that this is not the time to leave. I have to die here. And um, he didn't leave. He didn't accept to leave. The last day of my time um, in Iran arrived. And when I, um, I just remember that um, he sat on the couch. I curled up in his arms, now really, really fragile because of the tortures and the age. And we just cried. There was nothing to say. You know, we just cried and cried. And I fell asleep. And in the morning, right before I had to go to the airport, when I woke up, he was still awake. I think he hadn't even blinked an eye all night. And he was playing with my hair. That was the last day. You know, a few years later, uh, I got a phone call. And I heard that he threw himself from the sixth floor a balcony of the same balcony that I was sitting next to that last morning when I woke up in Tehran. It was time for him to go, he thought, and he had done what he could, and this was freedom to him. I had no choice but to respect his choice, and I had no choice but to uh, find another way to remember him. Um, anger was not uh, an answer because, um, well, my upbringing was not based on anger. My upbringing was based on you work with what you have and you try to make the most of it. I can't tell you how much I realized the importance of having the ability to go to the grave of the person you love when they die. I had an aching need to go and be by his grave, and I could not. I could not, just, just as many of my friends right now can't be there next to their loved ones, even when they die. I couldn't be at his funeral, none of us could. And I had to find a way, I had to find a way to deal with this anger that was consuming me. There's many questions that I had. And well, what other choice did I have but to, but to evolve into another variation of who my parents were, a human rights advocate. And um, I remember, I, th I think it was maybe the third week after his death, um, while sitting crying at home, uh, my husband and I decided, well, let's just start an organization in his name. 
very cool Leslie at first. <laughs> and so we stayed up together and we wrote a business plan and um, there it came, the Siamak Foods and Foundation that is now um, an organization registered in the US that promotes freedom of expression and defends the right of human rights advocates in Iran that use creativity and innovation um, to promote um, various kinds of rights. Um, that organization became my way to mourn, became a way to grieve. And, um, you know, in, in the last phone call I had with my dad, um, I, I was about to run to class and, and he had called me, like he always called me at, at the wrong times. Um, and he said, so what are your exact future plans after graduation? And I was very annoyed. I said, dad, I have to go. I have to go to class and I don't have an answer for it. I don't know. Um, um, I'll call you tomorrow. I love you. And I, and there, you know, I hung up and I left. Tomorrow never arrived. But I think today is, is that tomorrow. I'm wearing the same suit that I wore when I spoke at his memorial seven years ago. Because I waited for this day to be able to share my story with incredible people like you. What I am here, what I would love to, to say here today is that when we talk about a political prisoner, we talk about a family, we talk about a community. And the children of political prisoners are not just victims, they're witnesses. They are, um, they are comrades of their parents. Um, we, as the children of political prisoners, cannot be erased. They can torture our parents, they can harass us, they can kill them, they can torture them, they cannot erase us. We, will ju we, just raise, uh, we just rise to be the next generation of advocates. We have a story to tell. We have, uh, we have watched our loved ones suffer so much that we just simply cannot go on without telling that story. And so, if there are ever children, if there are any children of political prisoners that can hear me today um, online or here in this crowd, I want you to know that you are not invisible. Your story is important and it is your story. It's not your parents' story. And that your voice matters. We are history. We are not just a story. We, we are history. We are the history that they have tried to erase from all those books in schools. And our, our story is, is often repressed because they're scared of it, because there's nothing more powerful than a child having to endure her parents going through what they go through for, for, just because they are fighting the, for the rights of other people. Today in Iran, we have many political prisoners. Many of them are fathers. Many of them are mothers. Many of them are simply fighting for the rights of uh, their lawyers and they're fighting for, um, for the rights of their clients and then they put the lawyers in jail. They are workers who are just fighting for their uh, labor rights. They are members of ethnic groups and religious minorities. And yet their children are are, are forced to believe that their parents are, are some sort of criminals that, they, that deserve to suffer, and they deserve to suffer with them. There is no such thing. We are on the right side of history. And our story is as, as a collective journey of, of a community, of a society for a better future. My love to all of those children of political prisoners. We will one day rise together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your powerful story. And uh, I think your message will be with us through the whole uh, evening and further on. Thank you so much for sharing it. Are you ready for one more? <laughs> Our next uh, speaker is uh, Saina Erheim. She's an award-winning journalist from Serbia. Uh, she's a senior media specialist with the Institute of War and Peace uh, Research. Zaina, welcome. Well, it's not easy to start after you. Thanks for that. Well, I'll, I'll try that my story will cheer you a bit, although it's not really cheerful. 
Um, what I'm going to be speaking today is about a story of me turning, or maybe just developing my journalism with activism. And I will start from childhood as well. So my name is Zena, and Zena in Arabic means pretty. And being pretty is really what most of the families in our society would wish for their daughter to be. Nothing else. It's a great investment. If your daughter is pretty, she has much more chances to be able to get better proposal. So married to a rich man, be a good housewife where everything comes to her. Sadly, or maybe luckily, my family didn't have that. I was raised in a very conservative town. I think many of you who follow Syrian news know it. It's named Idlib. The public spaces in my town were very much limited. The only two activities that I could do in my youth were karate and volunteering in the Red Crescent because my brother was in those two. And I think this picture really represents my childhood and my youth. Like, it was a very much masculine space. Everything is so masculine. And that woman on the right, she wasn't from my hometown. She was visiting. Um, what does that mean? Well, for me, my early battles started as a girl and then as a teenager in a patriotic, in many cases, misogynist um, community and society. For maybe not for not wearing a headscarf. I had the first actual battle when I was 15 and I was told by some of my family members that I must wear the headscarf as all the women and the girls in my hometown. For some reason that really now I cannot tell why, I didn't and I resisted. And I paid the price with, for that. And until very recently, I thought that I got all this harassment, which is not just sexual, they were actually touching my body in the street because I'm not wearing a veil and I'm paying the price for that. Not all of it was really bad. Some woman would just reach me in the street and saying, you have a very beautiful hair. Why would you want it to be burning in hell? Just cover your head. So that was my, uh, my first battle. I even remember the first hug I've ever had. It was, um, I think, 2 p.m., and I was going to my Arabic class when a boy from the neighborhood just ran toward me and hugged me in front of my classmates. And my teacher was standing on that corner waiting for us to come. I felt really ashamed. I felt like I did something wrong, and they all witnessed my shame at that moment. The last thing I, I did was deciding to study journalism, and I mean I did to my society and community and even family. I was the first woman in my province to start to decide to study journalism. Journalism is for men, and it really corrupts the owner of the girls. Um, I do remember two of my aunts were actually sitting next to me saying, like, you know, if you decide to go to Damascus, which is far from here, and study journalism, no man from our province would agree to marry you. You're going to be spinster. Um, well, I disappointed them a bit. I got married twice until now. <laughs> I will be moving forward to the uprising, 2011. Well, that's not in my hometown. This picture is in Aleppo. It's after the massacre, um, the chemical massacre that happened in Damascus suburb where almost more than 1,000 people were killed by the Assad regime. However, the uprising for me was the time where I actually gained my space in the streets back in my hometown, in the same hometown where I got the first hug, where I got rubbed and I needed a boy to, to walk around with me although he is like 10 years younger, just to have a male on my side. I was walking in the streets with more than 3,000 men on my own, chanting. N none of them even dare to speak with me. Well, those who are overprotective came and say, like, dear sister, just go to, this, to the street side. We don't want you to get arrested or harassed or whatever. Um, and then I was shouting, like, this is my right. I am here as you are. I have the same bravery that you have, so let me alone. And then after, like, more than 10 discussions and debates, one of them took, really stopped in front of me and he said, she is my sister, leave her alone. No one is going to be speaking with her. At that moment, we were passing by my high school. And I was like, 
wondering how many of those men actually touched me before. From how many of them I actually got scared and ran the whole way back home. It was a very like, contradicting moment in my life. I owned the space and I felt I do belong. In that period of time, I met this incredible woman whose name is Razan Zaytouni. She is a human rights defender and lawyer. She created the first revolutionary um, entity, which was called Local Coordination Communities, and I helped her to establish the media office of it. Razan went against all oaths. She resisted the regime when we didn't even dare to really say what we're controlled by. We were chanting for it in like, the forcibly demonstrations, pro-regime demonstrations. We were, we were grabbed out of schools to the streets to do so. She was then defending those human rights um, advocators or those who dared to be in opposition at that time. When the uprising started, she took a leading role. And, and, and funny enough, at that time, the main two bodies of the revolution were led by two women. After being harassed and then her her husband uh, was arrested. I actually do remember that moment. We were working on Skype like for 16 hours a day, really. Um, I, I, got, I lost plenty of weight because I forgot to eat at that time. And for sure, all for free. We, we were all volunteers. And we had this virtual room for news and then virtual uh, room for translation. And then we would send all the information to the TV channels and advocators and even to the embassies at that time. And like suddenly, Razan wrote, the arrest of Wa'il Hamadi from this part of the town, and they took that and that. I was like, I, I, I couldn't like, believe what I'm reading, and then I double-checked with a colleague, isn't Wa'il Razan's husband? And they said, yes, she didn't give him one more minute than any other detainee. She treated him as every detainee that she is documenting and she is writing about. For being that and for documenting all violations from all parts, she later has been kidnapped by um, what is called Jaysh al-Islam, or the Islam Army, which is supposedly an opposition group. She stood again in front of their violations. She dared them. They threatened her. She didn't respond. She even refused to wear the headscarf in their areas. And she told them, as long as you're committing violation, expect me to report it. Until now, we don't know whether Razan is alive, most probably not but I can't really do any public speaking without speaking about her. I'm going to go to Raqqa now. Raqqa, which is only known for being the capital of the caliphate. For me, Raqqa was the capital of freedom and revolution. Well, yeah, that blondie litter hair, it, it was me at that time. And what I want to say about Raqqa is that that was the first visit ever for me to Raqqa in 2013. Um, when she was captured by the opposition. I was amazed by the amount of women who were active in that town. Every CSO, every um, um, NGO that was working there had at least half of their staff or activists of women. They even established a feminist group who were active in that period of time. More than 30 publications were being distributed in it. And this is like within two months of being captured by the opposition. Um, the last visit I did to Raqqa, it was December 2013, before it completely fell into ISIS. But ISIS were there in, 2000, um, in, in December 2013. And it also amazed me again, mainly the women. I do remember um, I, was, I was in a car passing by the main headquarter of ISIS then. So ISIS was there, but there were also other battalions which are mainly local Syrians. And the women in the streets, they were walking without a headscarf, some of them even wearing like short skirts. And even those with headscarf, they were putting a very bright lipstick, like orange lipstick. Passing by those jihadis in the streets who are completely wearing black, these long Afghanis, looking them into the eyes where the jihadis are just looking down and, and walking like very fast, passing them by. For me, like, I've never imagined that someone would really resist such a criminal entity with a lipstick or with walking in the street. One of them really had hair done very beautifully. I couldn't resist. I like, took off myself out of the car and said, you look very beautiful. And my friend was like, you know, you're harassing girls in the streets. Come back. 
we're going to put us in trouble. This is also in Raqqa, and that was the first ever mixed gender training that I did in rebel controlled areas. Um, more than half of the girls who attended the training were women. And here I will, um, I will be um, remembering Dr. Ismail Hamid. His girl was attending the training and we had one of the jihadis knocking on the door, our door and saying like what you're doing and why you're mixed gender and you have men and women, what you're plan planning for. And he is the one who stood in front of him and he said, that's my daughter who is inside. I trust her. Those are her friends. If you don't believe in that, it is your problem. And he really pushed him out. A year later, Dr. Ismail has been kidnapped, um, most probably by ISIS, and most probably um, he has been executed as well. This is also on the Raqqa. And at that time, ISIS started arresting some um, journalists and activists. So me and two friends decided to hold these panels to really challenge them. Osama, who is on the right, Osama Hassan himself was kidnapped later with his brother. And as most of those Syrians who are kidnapped by ISIS are mostly dead. And the sad thing for me is that we always speak about those Westerns who are being kidnapped or killed by ISIS, but no one knows any Syrian or even Iraqi who has been arrested or kidnapped or killed, although they are really the majority of them. Here is another amazing, resilient woman. Her name is Suad Nofil. Even before the international coalition heard about ISIS and decided that this is the ultimate threat for the world, we were actually resisting and fighting ISIS ideologically on the ground. For more than three months, Suad was holding a panel and protesting in front of ISIS headquarters in Raqqa on her own. She was holding a panel every single day and stand in front of their headquarters until some, one of them would come kick her out, beat her, whatever. She is a teacher. She survived eventually. Um, after plenty of threats, she left. The sad thing that after leaving, like a woman who has such a courage, after leaving, she lost it all and she really disappeared. She's in Europe, she's fine. But I mean, as an activist, as a person with such a power, she was defeated when she got out, not when she was facing this criminal group. And in the panel, she, she says, the prisons of the Iraq, um, and, and they're called then Iraq and Sham um, group, equals the prisons of regime. I did the same too, not, not as courageous as hers. I hold this panel in Idlib, not in Raqqa. Um, in this panel, which is dated 10th of July 2013, so also before the world has heard about ISIS, which I'm then eventually accused all Syrians of being pro-ISIS, well, that's a little proof that we really defeated, or at least tried to fight them before that. In this panel, I say freedom from my friend Aksam from the prisons of Assad and Muhammad Noor from the prisons of ISIS. Um, Aktam got out, however, Muhammad is also most probably um, executed by ISIS. And I put this picture, not to show off how courage I am, but more to tell you about who was the cameraman of it. The one who took that picture for me is Raed Al Faris. He, is, um, he was a well-known media citizen activist, or media activist, and he posted it on their page. So he even took that into their own page, which was very known, and he was known. After the uprising and those lovely images and stories, um, those traditions, the patriotic society, those extremists really became the upper hand of our society. Um, and then I think everything started to get to the worst case. Um, by the way, all these pictures I took with my mobile phone, most of them I took them like stealing because I, I didn't have like, the, enough ability to take them with a proper camera. Then I started becoming suddenly dependent. Well, there is no common between me and the sheep, but we just, both of us needed someone to lead us to wherever we're moving. I've always been uh, an independent and very powerful one, and suddenly, Yet again, I needed a man to walk me around, to speak on my behalf on the checkpoints. 
and in some cases even to take my camera and film for me. I also lost the battle for not wearing a headscarf and after more than 15 years I was forced to put it on again but only inside Syria. However, like I am there, I am ready to die for this people and this cause which is enforcing me to do things that I've never wanted to do. And this is one of the people who were my fixers at that time and I needed them and I was really following whatever they're telling me which is so not me, but I was forced to. And this is how I ended up being, not only with a proper headscarf but with a long coat as well. And this is the last winter um, I spent in Aleppo. The main challenges, which I think my main trauma is not really about being battle bombed, is not knowing the differences between the Sikhoi and M16, all these kind of uh, different machine guns. My main trauma as a journalist is for suppressing myself and applying these different layers of censorship on everything that I do or post. At some point, I, start, I stopped writing anything, even my Facebook posts. I start asking some friends to review them before posting them because every single word that I say has a, con a consequences and this consequences is not only on me. If I don't wear a headscarf, my garden is going to be punished, not me. So it was like a huge amount of pressure. Um, if I wrote something against one group, as simple as it is, someone might get bothered and shoot me in the street. No one would even question them. It is completely chaotic and there is no any kind of justice. So for me, from turning in from a journalist who is fighting for freedom of expression, defending that, into someone who suppressed herself was one of the main traumas that I had and I'm still overcoming until now. The second thing as a woman is being turned into this very power, into this very weak and powerless uh, dependent person. Not to be able to buy my own grocery on my own, uh, not to be able to stay home on my own, nothing. I always needed someone on my mind and that someone needs to be man. Um, on all the checkpoints that I passed, um, I, I don't have that much families left inside Syria, so I had really to create ones. So I created two uncles, three husbands, and two brothers. And in the Raqqa trip that I told you about, the last one I had, I actually took the ID of the sister of my friend, who was um, my male garden then, and I had to memorize all the family members of his, because on the checkpoints, they might separate us, and they did once, and asked me, what's the name of your aunt? To just compare the answers with him to make sure that we relate. So on the regime's checkpoints, I was scared that I might be caught as a journalist or with the recorder or the camera. On the jihadist checkpoint, I was just trying to prove that I am with a man who, is, who I am allowed to be with. Um, for some reason, all the IDs for the different girls that I used on checkpoints were for tall girls with brown eyes, and I've never been caught. <laughs> this picture is took in um, Latakia Mountains. I was then with um, a guy, a little guy, whose name was Hamoudi. He was 23 years old, studying architect. And he was very much conservative. And he agreed to go with me on this trip because a friend forced him to. We went and we had so many troubles on the checkpoints. And I was really so upset because like, at some point, like, this is my country, this is what I aimed for, this is why I demonstrated for, and then you see people who don't know um, whatever st standing on the checkpoints and asking you this stupid question, trying to prove that you're just with the right person. Anyway, I got really upset. And then he pulled the card over on this mountain and he said, get off Zena. And I thought he's going to push me over that because I was giving him a very difficult time. Instead, he told me, take your headscarf off. And I was like, are you sure, Hamoudi? He said, yes, breathe. Take it off and breathe. And he took that picture from me. He is very conservative. He wouldn't marry a woman who is not wearing a headscarf. But he said, keep it off and the checkpoints need to deal with me and I will take that. 
I love headscarf. I think I will marry a girl with a headscarf, but I will also defend you not wearing a headscarf with my life. He lost his life, but not for my headscarf. He lost it for a missile later. But the virtual and real attacks that I want to speak about is more related to us. I think we had that in common. All of us, we are under virtual and real attacks all the time, not only for being women, but for being outspoken, for being in public spaces, for defending human rights. All these simple little things that you do to let go, to enjoy yourself, is something that we need to have strategic plans for, to get drunk, to dance in the streets, to wear what you like without worrying about someone taking pictures for you. A scandal could be you being seen on the beach with a bathing suit, and it happened for one of our female politicians. Having this pressure of what you're doing and not being able to let go is one of the main difficulties, not to mention all this bullying about whatever you do, and this huge projector of spotlight on every single mistake that you might be doing. This is really hard. This is Aleppo. This picture is the reason why I was kicked out eventually from the rebelhood, Syria. At that time, when the Charlie Hebdo incident happened, and I decided to take a stand with the journalists who have been killed, it doesn't mean I agree or disagree with them, it doesn't matter. What I'm sure of is that no one is supposed to be killed for whatever they do. And sadly, it wasn't only me who paid that price for this picture. It was like my entire family. Even my mom, who was living in Turkey, she was very much scared of whoever is knocking on the door. She was checking from the balcony before opening that door. And for some reason, the previous French president decided to say my full name in his speech about the Jusui Charlie incident without even checking with me. And my ex-partner was taken into Sharia court with the Holland speech and with this picture. And he was the one who has been put on the Sharia trial because his wife has decided to commit a blasphemy and support those who are drawing those things about the Prophet Muhammad. So deciding to stand up in these circumstances and then feeling that the world is falling apart and even those who are living very far away causing even much more trouble. What I had in like, return from that, like nothing. Um, whenever I apply for a visa, I still get... I, actually, the, the first visa I got to Oslo, to, to Norway, it was for five days. Five days visa to Oslo. So how the West really respect those who are trying to defend the freedom of expression with their lives, that would give you an example. Eventually, that led me to leave the rebelhood series, and I have never went back afterwards. This picture, um, this is a woman on a motorbike, and she is the first woman ever I've seen driving a motorbike in Idlib province, and it was, it was war. She, she was completely covered, but for me, that was like, and amazing things to see. And I put her picture to tell you about the extra struggle, the outside struggles. So after doing um, this Charlie stand, um, I thought that at least I, I have a proof now that I am not terrorist. You can really deal with me as not pro-ISIS or potential terrorist. However, at that year, um, I was traveling to receive Index on Censorship Award in Britain when the Home Office decided to confiscate my passport because Assad regime reported it stolen. Well, they have my like, stamp, they have my face, they have my name, birth, date of birth, and I actually studied my master's degree on the taxpayer's money because I got a scholarship. That's all was not enough because Assad says, I am a stolen, I am a theft, I stole my own passports. That incident led for me to eventually become a refugee in the UK. So at some point, you have a proof that all the world is really against you because you are taking that position to stand against all odds. Uh, surely I'm a f I can't travel to the US because there is a ban against me because I was born in Syria as well. So what keeps me out? What keeps me going? One of the main things is the support. This picture is in Idlib province, and that's Ra'ed, 
who I told you about, who took the picture of me with a poster. Um, my friend then forced me to wear the headscarf in Edlip town. And when Blaet saw me, he says, why you're putting it on? I know you don't put headscarf. And I said, well, he forced me to because he is going to be dealing with the consequences. And then Ra'ed said, as long as I am here, you be as you are, and no one is going to be enforcing anything on you. And this is like the main square of that town. So I took it off, and we took that picture. Ra'ed was assassinated. Come on, I'm not crying. Two months ago, in the same town, actually very close to that point. Those people who stand with us, those people who are feminist by action, not by saying, are the ones who are targeted by all parts. Ra'ed established a local radio called the Fresh Radio, and he hired more than 50 local women to work in that radio. He asked me to train them. And then the Al-Qaeda affiliated group on Nusra decided that women's voices are haram and they shouldn't be on the radio. He kept the women and he really manipulated their voices and made them masculine with the editing of the auditions. And they kept working for that radio. And they kept making a living out of working as journalism. After his death, you can imagine what happened to those women. This is another picture from my ex-partner. After the Charlie incident, well, poor him, he had to be a free of charge, full-time fixer, driver, campaigner, you, you can imagine all that. After Charlie incident, I was so frustrated because many of those who were supposedly on my side, who are opposing the regime, started opposing me because I don't agree with their ideas. And by opposing, I don't mean like just disagreeing. Opposing mean don't mind me being killed or report me to be killed. At that point, I was so angry, frustrated, and only two or three people in Aleppo really took my side and stood with me. So he decided to bring all these balloons, and he wrote on them all of those groups who were threatening me, attacking me, and on one of them he says, Hababin, which are the good people who are standing by, by me. And I just kicked the hell out of those balloons and then just explode them. So that very simple gesture would tell you how frustrated I am and how essential this little support that we can get at those times can make a difference. Where to go on? That's my little Zara. She's three years old, and she was participating in an official event with me in this picture. So one of the reasons that I am going on is that I want her when she's going to be watching this video at some point, to be very much shocked and thinks that I'm really just entertaining you by telling you those stories, because she wouldn't really understand why I was being harassed in the streets, or why did I have to be threatened or killed for saying what I want to say. And as a person who got through all that and survived in some way, I know how it is for those little girls who are still inside and for their mothers and all of those women who are still trying or still going through all this stuff while we're speaking now. What you can do. This picture is taken in Der Zor, in my last visit there. Those are girls going to school. And really, at that moment in Der Zor, there was a mortar and a missile filling every five minutes. In half an hour before I get out of bed, I counted 26 ones. And those girls were, were on their way going to schools. What you can do? I think taking their back. Whenever someone is trying to attack or stab them in the back, take their sides. This event is named Women Voices Changing the Middle East. Give them speakers. Keep the speakers on. Shout loud. Whenever you're seeing someone publishing a scandalous picture of a feminist, report him, call the YouTube, call whatever, try to, stood, to stand with those women. Whenever you're seeing a woman in a very bad situation being bullied and attacked, respond on her behalf. Those small, small gestures would make them feel supported 
they would feel that their struggle worth and they're not on their own. And eventually, when you're very tired and desperate, you can find a kicking ass feminist that you can dance it all off with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Saina. I think we'd all like to dance with you uh, any time. <laughs> oh. One more speech uh, before we uh, have the panel sitting down to, to discuss how to go on from this. Uh, we're going to listen to Yasmin Al-Naderi. She's an activist from Yemen. Uh, she's currently living in Lebanon, where she's running the grassroots movement Peace Track. And she's working for women's voices to be heard at all levels of society. Yasmin, we'd like to hear your voice, please. Thank you. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm Yasmin from Yemen. And I will be sharing with you today for the very first time my personal story. So um, lately, um, every single morning, I wake up, I open my eyes, and I start to have this long conversation with myself to convince me to wake up and start my daily struggles. Sometimes I feel like I just want to give up and stay in my bed. But I can't afford it. I can't afford to rest or admitting um, to weakness. I'm a single mother and um, I have to take care of my daughter and my parents. And um, being strong is my only option. Uh, my life has changed so much because of the war. I have lost so many things. I lost my home, my job, my neighborhood, my country. This is war. It forces you to start over. And I'm not alone. This is the situation or the case of most of the Yemenis. They have lost so much. They even lost things more than I did. Um, surviving is not only about overcoming one unfortunate incident, but it's the art of resilience, um, hope, and strong will. Let me take you back to December 2013 um, to a military hospital compound during an emergency visit for me and my work colleagues. A band of terrorists attacked that hospital during my visit. And it was Al-Qaeda attack. And while I was waiting earlier in the hospital, um, I heard that, I, I was informed that the president was coming which alerted me to the situation and assisted me later on. Um, this attack was targeting him, but in the line of fire, Yemenis from all walks of life were killed. Not even Yemenis, but also international aid workers, volunteer doctors, and medical staff. Bullets rained equally on everyone. And I can still hear the gunshots, the screaming, actually, after the gunshots. But more <coughs> disturbingly was the silence that follows. And ironically, um, those dead people get more attention than those who are alive, who continue to live. And this day continues to haunt me as I had to call my family to say goodbye and to inform them why I was at that place and what I was doing. And uh, yeah, I had to ask them to promise me that they will take care of my daughter, my only daughter. 
And um, in that nightmare, 56 people lost their lives. 200 were injured. I lost to three of my work colleagues, and I could have been one of them. So to me, the cost of violence is very real. It is personal. Um, yeah, this is Leanne, my daughter. Um, this was not it. You know, after that, the worst happened. I was away abroad on a work mission when the war intensified and Sana'a airport was closed. I had left my daughter, who was a five years old, back at home, back in Yemen. Um, it was the hardest thing that I had ever w go through. I mean, surviving a terrorist attack was even easier to me. Because back then, I was alone facing death. But to imagine my daughter in that position and my family, not that I only felt helpless, but also I could not imagine life without them. Um, so it took us almost three months to be reunited again. And it was the longest days of my life. And after that, until today, we've been living of our suitcases as a single mother in exile and her little girl. I feel I'm privileged to be able to take care of her, to feed her, and to keep her away from the violence in Amman, in Jordan. I mean, safety is a privilege. And in Yemen, nowadays, so is food. Yemen has become the worst place to live, especially if you are a woman. It is the worst humanitarian tragedy in the world. Up to seven million people can no longer afford food, and they are actively starving. Mothers are searching for their disappearing sons. Women in besieged area are risking their lives, walking for hours just to provide food for their families. Girls who are revolting against hunger are beaten, detained, and abused. Um, um, in this case, the only thing that you could do is that we, you help whomever you can. We stand for ourselves. We've been helping each other like really working on solidarity in order to be able to help each other. These are mothers of abductees. Um, in 2015, I co-founded an organization called the Peace Track Initiative. We believed that Peace will not fall from the sky, but it will come from the local communities. We decided to work with women who are in the ground doing everything to help their communities and to bring peace to them. Women we are working with are contributing to resolving armed conflict disputes over uh, water and land in remote areas. They are facilitating mediation to release detainees. They are actually um, negotiating with armed groups to reopen schools. Although Yemeni women are really active on the local level, but they are largely excluded from the Yemeni peace process, especially at the official tracks. We've been calling for women inclusion since the beginning of the war but no one is listening to us. So recently, we decided that we will form a women delegation and just go. We're done calling for participation. We will be there because peace cannot be granted. It is always something that you claim for. And this is what I, owe, I vote to do. So this is my story, very quickly, just I tried to 
know that my story is the story of Yemen, and um, I have to have an answer for my daughter's question. When is the war going to end in Yemen? This is what I am doing. This is what I tell her when I travel, that your mommy is working really hard to bring peace to your country and to provide you with a very peaceful homeland that would keep you um, safe and preserve your dignity. This is exactly what we are all looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. You may sit down. Yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, I will welcome all three speakers to come back uh, up on stage. They will have the chance to talk together uh, and to lead uh, you and us through that uh, conversation. Uh, we have uh, Ingrid Salvesen, Norwegian journalist uh, from the podcast Du Verden. Please, may you take over the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Please join me. Hi, everyone, and uh, happy almost Women's Day. What a start uh, to the celebration of this day to be together here tonight. Um, happy that you all came. We will open up for uh, questions uh, from all of you uh, soon, so uh, have that in mind while we start mm -hmm. the conversation here. Mm -hmm. And very happy to have all of you here uh, with us today. Um, so powerful stories, it's almost hard to start uh, the conversation, but we will. Um, and I uh, thought I should start with you, Asada. Um, you mentioned in your talk how it's like to grow up in a family of, um, uh, that is very much shaped by the battle for human rights in Iran, and that you as an adult also became a part of that battle. And you mentioned that there was, um, for many years, you were trying to kind of uh, uh, subdue that activist in you. Uh, why did you do that and what changed? What made you go into activism? Um, yeah, that's a good question, a difficult one. <laughs> um, I think to, the why of it is that, um, at least in my family, it was, uh, you know, the, the story was not dissimilar to what um, my friends today said, in that I think when you're fighting for things to get better, you just hope that things get better by the time you are, your child is an adult and that your child to move, you know, can move on to do better things and, and feel free. And so, and I was in exile, um, you know, our exile began together with my mother, who I think was really hopeful that I can just move on, you know, and I can move on and that I can remember what happened, but, but, I, but that I just won't suffer as much as she thought I was. And, um, and so, you know, we had, we had a lot of conversations in exile. We became best friends. We became, you know, like each other's sisters. It was, it was not just a daughter-mother relationship. And so I think she was, she was bothered by the fact that I was living life vicariously through her and through my father. And so um, a lot of the push was really from my mother to just go on to explore. And I'm so thankful that happened because the philosophy was they, if they don't let you, you know, go back to the country you come from, that you love, own the rest of the world if you can. You know, And so I lived and I worked in places like Bangladesh, in India, in Argentina, in Mexico. <laughs> um, and um, I learned a lot from those places. And, and I think that's what, uh, you know, one of the things that I really feel um, saddened about when I think about today's um, youth in Iran and, and today's human rights advocates in Iran is that, um, like our friends mentioned, um, the, uh, you know, we have, we are, not only we're dealing with re repression at home, but we are dealing with a, 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 a situation of isolation abroad. They don't get visas, they don't get chances to study abroad, they don't, even if they do with the situa economic situation, they will just not be able to afford. And I had those opportunities, and um, I thought those journeys are going to let me away from Iran, 
But then in, in the end, it worked out like a circle. And I just took experiences from those moments and, and, and I came back. I, I remember during the Green Movement um, in 2009 in Iran, I kept wanting to go back to Tehran and my parents were very scared and, and I was in Bangladesh in the villages working uh, with women and my father on the phone told me, just close your eyes and imagine you're in Iran. There, is, there are not that many differences between villages in Bangladesh and <laughs> Iran. You can serve the women there the, way, the same way you can serve the women in Iran. And, and so they were trying to kind of keep me on my toes um, and, I, and I think in the end it worked out for the best because um, I had the opportunities that I wish really for millions of the youth today in Iran to have. There is a strong history of women's movements in Iran. Uh, how would you describe the, the women activism that is going on in Iran today? Um, yes, the, we have uh, quite a strong history of activism among women's rights um, advocates and activists in Iran. I think the story, um, their story, the story of the women's rights struggle in Iran is quite a long one, so I don't know how to make it short, but um, I, I think of it like this, for, for every single thing that women have been deprived of in Iran, they have found a solution to challenge it. For every single, and, and it, it can be from, it, it, it doesn't have to be grand. I mean, we, we managed um, in Iran, women have managed for years and years. It's not a new thing. It, since almost a week or two or three after the hijab became mandatory in Iran, the veil became mandatory, they began to challenge the, the Iranian government by just even the, the centimeter by which their scarf was away from their hair. So really, uh, the, the, the struggle began from something as small as that. Um, and and, it, and it's, to me, it's symbolic for everything else, for, for the, the, the women's rights um, lawyer struggle, for, for um, reforming the laws, um, for um, you know, female athletes, for uh, women artists, for ordinary women. So I think if you look at the Iranian society, you would really see Iranian women as quite present, which what I find really ironic is that for this visibility and for this presence, sometimes the Islamic Republic takes cr the credit for it, <laughs> that it actually has allowed women to, to be that visible, which is, I think, a mistake on the side of the international community because for every single one of those small openings um, that you see, if at all, is because you know we have had we have currently women in prison fighting for that, having fought for those rights. You know we have we have older generation of human rights lawyers, women like my mother Mehrangiz Kar, like the Nobel laureate Shirin Abadi. We have right now Nasrin Sutuda and Nargis Mohammadi in prison, all because they fought for human rights and so many other women. And another thing about women's rights movement in Iran that I find really important is that women's, because the struggle for women's rights is at the core of the um, the way the Islamic Republic runs, like they, they have put restricting women from restricting them to the right to their own body, to their rights, to the fam, you know, to everything. Um, women uh, have become an integral part of fighting against um, repression. And, and so when I say women struggling for human rights, I truly mean it. It's not just women's rights. Um, women's voices and women's approaches, women's peaceful approaches um, for um, achieving human rights in Iran has become uh, in some ways exemplary and model for, for other um, groups of advocates. Um, and um, I think we have come to a situation where, in Iran at least, I think, if we see any kind of change, any kind of social change, it will be done by women. I can promise you that. <laughs> it also links uh, what you were talking about now, uh, reminds me of what you were talking about also, Saina, of how these women with the lipstick were, were challenging and kind of owning the space and in the streets uh, in Raqqa or in Syria. And, and uh, your um, work that you mentioned partly in your speech was also um, training c uh, citizen journalists and among them also women. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, why was it important for you to train citizen journalists in Syria and why was it important that women were among that group? We're related to the first part. Um, well, when the uprising started, there were very few professional journalists who were daring to report what is happening. So many carpenters, university students start taking their mobile phones and reporting what is happening. 
at that time, I was privileged that I didn't only had the chance to finish my journalism studies, but also got a scholarship to do my master in Britain. Um, I did some work as a journalist myself. Then I felt it's really very selfish to be a journalist in those circumstances. Um, I decided that I want to pass over those things that I've learned to the others who are starting to become journalists. So the training started with those who have some experience or have been trying or filming or doing citizen journalism. And then after a couple of months, I realized that I'm only training men. And believe me, that was very difficult to be taken seriously by the local men, and I'm a local woman, uh, by making them being convinced that despite being a woman, I know a little bit more than you. Everything was so challenging. However, I decided that I will invite all of those women who are interested in becoming citizen journalists, or at least just learning what is journalism, um, to the training. The first one I did was uh, with Ra'ed in, in uh, Idlib. And I got 14 women on that first training, and plenty of children, because none of their husbands or families agreed to care for their children while they're doing a journalism training. <laughs> so we actually, I, I had to ask one of them to volunteer and leave the training to babysit the kids because I can't really do anything with nine children jumping in my face. And then I started the training and then I realized that only two of those women actually had a university degree. Most of them only had the ninth degree because that's when you become 15 and usually are forced into marriage. Despite that fact, at the last day when we were finishing up with a practical story, six of them provided, in my opinion, very professional ones and some stories that I wouldn't even uh, been able to done myself because I don't have that access. Uh, one of the stories was done by a girl named Nisreen. Um, she was like maybe 10 years younger than me and has five kids. And she wrote her story about the rise of domestic violence after the uprising. And she linked it with the frustration for men, for all the frustration which is being taken into the weaker uh, member of the family. And I was very much shocked because she managed to do an interview with the sheikh, with an imam. And in those conservative societies, mainly after the war, it is impossible to see a stranger man. And there is no public space for you to see that man. So I asked her, like, how could you manage to, do, to get his answers? And she said, well, I thought about it. I don't even have internet to interview him. I don't even know he, if he has a Skype account or whatever. So I wrote the questions for him on a piece of paper, and I sent it with my son to him at the mosque. And he read it, and he wrote it back and sent it to me. So like physical messenger. <laughs> However, she managed the story. And this is just to echo what Azadi has said. Being suppressed in so many terms is teaching you to be resilient, is teaching you to find your ways around that. And many of those women who I trained, at least 10 of them, are still living in Idlib and Aleppo, and they are still reporting and doing uh, freelancing. And many of them are actually supporting their families from this career that four years ago they had no idea what it was, and they've never really thought that they would become journalists. That's amazing news. Um, do they, what are the, um, how do you say, what is the situation now for many journalists in Syria and where you, I mean, you yourself had to leave? Well, it's difficult to speak about one Syria now. Um, there are different challenges that journalists are facing in the Kurdish controlled, from those who are controlled by the regime, Iranians and Russians, from those who are controlled by Al Qaeda affiliated groups. I think the only one common thing among all those platforms is that all the independent journalists or voices or activists are being attacked by all. They're all being put in danger and they're not really getting the support that they're supposed to be getting from the international freedom of expression organizations. When an independent journalist got killed, they, as Ra'ed, um, he was fighting for two months to get funding for the radio and he couldn't. And when he got killed, those donors issued these condolences. Mm -hmm. I was like, really? Um, his partner, who was also in the picture with me, he started after Ra'ed was killed, he really started criticizing al-Nusra or al-Qaeda very loudly and clearly, and he had to go into hiding. He now made it to Turkey, and he called me yesterday saying, Lena, I'm jobless, I don't speak Turkish, I don't speak English, I just know how to be a defender and a brave person, what should I do? That wouldn't really support your family and feed your kids. So having a plan for those who are we encouraging to take those risks and defend freedom of expression, give them a plan B, for them to keep alive. This is all not happening. And I think this is one of the challenges, even for those who survived physically, but are still struggling on the mental level. 
Um, there is extra one on women in all levels, even in the Kurdish areas, which are being perceived as the most equal ones. Um, but a journalist that I interviewed there, she told me, I'm still being stereotyped, I'm not allowed to do about the women and children related stories. Um, in the regime held areas, many women journalists are being harassed on checkpoints by the male uh, soldiers who haven't maybe even seen a woman for years now. Um, they might very, very um, likely get arrested, tortured, raped, and all the systematic torture that is being uh, happening in Assad prisons. And in the opposition, they might be killing by accident, they might be killing <laughs> as assassinated, um, they're limited, uh, their movement is limited, um, it, their faces, they, they all use fake names because they can't really say who they are because it's chaotic and again, there is no any kind of protection. Uh, Jasmine, speaking of, uh, I mean, echoing both of you of how oppression also teaches you how to deal with it. You created your own women delegation. Mm -hmm. uh, we just heard, um, I mean, there has been uh, empirical evidence that including women in peace negotiating processes uh, will make it a higher chance of success. But why do you think that women are still not included? Well, because, first of all, they're not... I'm not really sure if, if, if like our presence will make the peace happening very soon, because um, women already now have their national peace and security agenda. They have the very their their recommendations. They know exactly the roadmap towards peace. Um, I mean, if you if you leave it to the choice of the delegations, of course they will not have women among them. Why not? Because because they're more like followers, and like I don't know. It's like you know they're following more like orders that comes from leaders. I would say, but not as a woman. Women are really fighting to have their right to be part of this uh, process, and on a local level, as I said, they're doing everything but still excluded. And what is very disappointing is that they're excluded from the official track, which <coughs> should be you know, something that the UN and the international community should be having the women on, talking about empowering women and having the women. How would you empower them if you're not negotiating with those uh, delegations to have those women among them? I mean, we had only one woman, and she was nominated by her political party. And we were so happy having her, because after those uh, rounds of peace talks, she was freely and openly speaking about uh, the key points discussed, and uh, knowing exactly who was not making the, the peace happening, and, and who was not really um, um, helping the process to be um, happening. So we have now um, involvement, but indirectly, which is um, the Women Advisory Group, technical group. Uh, they advise the UN Special Envoy. Uh, but still, you know, we don't want to be, we need to be on the front line. You know, this is our right. Sometimes it feels like uh, the people are thinking we need to have the peace first and then we can deal with gender equality. This is absolutely or not right because mm. if you're speaking about peace building, how would you build a peace without having the woman involved? You know, and um, now we are working on having an independent woman delegation. Um, and we're going to call for this until we have it because, I mean, they could have came up with more like ideas, like what if um, the two delegations were giving extra seats for women, and if women are not there, then they should be empty, they should left empty. Or um, how could we influence on the process? So this is something that we really need to have support at. And one reason you are, or the, the reason you're all here today is because you're part of this uh, initiative mm. um, that is also aimed to uh, uh, collaborate between uh, different women activists in the region. Um, and I wanted to uh, discuss this a little bit um, with you. Like, what can be the benefits of 
collaborating or learning from each other? Are the country situations so specific that it's really hard to to get any, I mean, advice from each other? Or um, I think we share the same, let's say, obstacles, and um, like <laughs> this war somehow is like we're key actors too. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, like for example with Syrian women, it's the same peace process and peace things, negotiation, we learn from each other, we support each other, and we learn from the mistakes. So, so yes, and um, same thing with, 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 the, with Iran. On the personal level, yeah. like we just met yesterday, mm. and we just had a very quick, big hamburger dinner. <laughs> And then we started really speaking about the virtual challenges, the actual challenges, our concerns about the kind of bullying that we would get after today's event. And obviously, everything was so much in common. Mm -hmm. We do face plenty of things that are in common because we're outspoken, we're women, we're from the region. Most of our communities are considered to be conservative. They don't really know how to handle that. This is on one level, having so much in common more than many of the women who are in our region, maybe I have much more in common with the women who are here. And secondly, this kind of support that you have people who understand you, who have gone through what you're going through, who also cannot suppress that damn activist inside you, and they're still having this battle despite what is going on. I think this is one essential hand that you wouldn't be able to clap without. Mm -hmm. You're saying you're also part of the same conflict or your countries. Um, is it uh, can it be uh, difficult to collaborate uh, when your kind of your families are in the no? <laughs> well, I think the thing about being an activist or being brought up as an activist is that you think there is a solution to everything. <laughs> so it's about finding the right approach. I think yes, in some cases, I think it can be dangerous if you have relatives in the country yes. that can be harassed, or, or even you know abroad, as as you mentioned. I mean, you can get um, the online harassment these days is not a joke. Um, and so I think yes, the risks are there. The consequences can be there. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, I think there are ways to do it, um, to also break the taboo so others are not you know, as, as, um, as terrified to, to join, um, you know, to, uh, to hold each other's hand and to, to try to collaborate. We even face this domestically. I mean, in Iran, if, if you, in, in many cases, if you uh, defend the rights of ethnic groups, you're immediately called a separatist. Um, and, and so it's about finding the right ways among the communities, both I, I think domestically and internationally and regionally, um, and, and finding common grounds and common issues that, um, that um, are um, highlighting the similarities more than the differences. But I also, another thing I wanted to point out is that, I, and I don't know if you find yourself in the same situation, but I do uh, often, which is um, as we become, um, uh, community organizers and, and people who you know who are sort of in the middle in the in the center of a hub of of uh, of helping other advocates uh, become stronger and become more united. Um, people look at us thinking we know it all, <laughs> and so we are constantly training other people. We are constantly sharing our knowledge with others. Um, but the truth is we need to learn ourselves all the time and, and that's how we learn and that's how we exchange knowledge and that's how we exchange the experiences, the, um, the challenges and, and I mean even in tonight's speeches I, I feel I have a few ideas that I will take back you know, to my organization and I will discuss it with my team and um, we can't always know everything and we can't always teach to others, um, and, and so these are the opportunities. I think big, one of the biggest things is knowledge share, and another thing is that um, oftentimes, um, at least in our part of the world, um, self-care and emotional, uh, emotionally uh, nourishing yourself is considered a bad thing, especially if you're an activist. You're supposed to only care about other people, and I think in settings like this, um, you know, you, the friendships that emerge, the common understanding on a very human level that emerge uh, helps to, um, you know, 
to cool off sometimes, you know, and, and to laugh together after you cry freely. You don't have to hold your tears, you know, you can cry and laugh at the same time. And, and I think there is magic in that. And you raised some very important points, which is uh, how do you keep going? And some of you also mentioned this in your speech, how to keep your activism sustainable in a way, both emotionally, but also financially. Uh, what are your strategies, if you want to share some of them with us tonight? I don't know, Jasmine. How do you keep going? I mean, helping others makes me happy, makes me, um, you know, um, eager to do more. And uh, yeah, when you see things are happening, like for example, when we plan something together with the woman, and when these messages, you know, reach out to the people that we want really them to hear our voices. And when we feel like we're changing, we're making a change, this makes us really always, you know, um, hungry to do more and more. And yes, I mean, uh, we will continue because it's also important that women should not be always seen as a volunteers, you know? This is something that we should also consider that they should be economically empowered in order to be independent and to have this power to, to sustain this, you know, um, productivity. So I think this is very important. And what I've noticed is that protection programs, we are lacking protection programs for women from the three countries while exchanging. There is no long-term protection programs. This is really needed for women. Is this a problem that women are often looked upon as volunteers in their, in their human rights work? Or? I mean, it, I mean they, it, is, it is usually, like, I don't know, but it's, it's like when you see always that women are taking these um, even positions with, NG, with international NGOs. They would give them this position or the payment would be very little. Because you're local. Not because you're a woman. Uh, yeah, and, and no, it's just in, in, in general, this is what we notice, that uh, they should also think about uh, empowering them economically. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something else in your speech, Asada, which I found interesting, how you said childhood and youth are the biggest uh, threats to ideological uh, kind of machines, what you said. Um, how would you... You also mentioned now that you are kind of worried about the youth in Iran? Is there, um, is there any examples of how they are being a, still being a threat to the, to the regime? Sorry, what? Are they still a threat to the regime in Iran? Uh, yes, I think that's... I don't think it's just to the Iranian government. I think any, any state that tries to run ideologically has a challenge of dealing with children, mischievous children and youth. Um, I think part of it is because... Um, I mean, I think a few things, and it's perhaps my, my personal experiences, not really a, a deep study, but I think, um, you know, happiness and, and being able to find any excuse to be happy. I remember I found my childhood in Iran, and I was born during the Iran-Iraq war, and then, you know, after, so it wasn't an easy time, you know. Um, any excuse that you could find, we would find to go and dance in the streets. <laughs> Anything. I mean, a football team, you know, winning, a local, national, international, or, um, uh, you know, um, any, anything. Like, I mean, for instance, in school, um, uh, we had one, uh, in, in high school, we had one male teacher, um, and um, we, we tortured this man so much. It was an all-girls school. And as soon as he would write on the board, it was ma a math class. As soon as he would turn back to write on the board, we would all take our lipsticks and put on lipsticks. <laughs> and he would turn and he would be scared for his job. I mean, because we were not allowed to have the lipsticks to begin with. But, you know, a male teacher with a group of high school students all with lipsticks. Or, or um, uh, you know, so many of these kinds of things. And it's a challenge to manage. It's a question of managing happiness um, and, and allowing a, le a little bit of happiness so that people don't end up in the streets and protesting um, and questioning your legitimacy but at the same time managing it and I think with, with children and with youth um, who are just so fearless naturally so fearless I mean um, it's, it's very difficult because uh, you don't know when it's gonna go out of your control 
Um, and at, and another thing is, as um, you know, I think one of the strategies of these kinds of governments is to create a collective identity, um, collective political identity to the degree that they can. But by the time they can, um, you know, but but so the brainwashing has to be so strong um, and that it, it, it kind of. Uh, you know, it has to surpass this natural tendency to be individual, to be individuals, to smile, to play, to to you know be a typical unruly teenager, and um, and it's always a battle. I really see it like a battle, um, um, and at the same time, um, you have to show internationally that um, that you know you take care of your youth, you take care of your children. So you need to have you need to have a theatrical element of that as well to the world to show that you're not the worst, you know, uh, government in the world. So I think, I think there is a lot of that happening. Um, it's, 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 it's sort of a back and forth. Um, it's a uh, very, if you want to call it in a peaceful way, I think it's a very strange dance <laughs> between the youth and the Iranian government. So. We will soon open up for uh, questions from the audience, so uh, feel free to think uh, what you want to ask. Um, there's, speaking of this battle between the youth and, and the government, uh, often there is, uh, at least in the West, there seems to be this view that uh, at least if uh, some of these countries are stable, that's more important than, for example, criticizing them for not giving human rights to their population or to women. What, how would you define stability for your countries or societies? Like, do you think that these countries are stable today in a good way? Well. But Iran, for example, which is... Yeah. You know, I, I've had to think about this question a lot as Iran comes on and off of the international stage. Sometimes it's a good guy, sometimes it's a bad guy. Um, and uh, you have to constantly ask yourself where you stand as a human rights advocate. This is what I have decided for myself. I think no matter what happens in Iran, I'm going to be a pain in the neck of this government or the next government because I think we have many years to fix our problems and um, I personally believe in gradual change uh, but no matter what happens I, I think that um, human rights has to be a constant. There are a lot of variables. A uh, question of you know, uh, whether the world is at peace with Iran, whether um, Iran is at a risk of being at another war, whether sanctions are going to cripple the economy, on and on internationally. But I think where I stand is no matter what, whether I have to defend the rights of the people to be able to um, voice their opinions and to voice their demands. Um, and I cannot stop and all the time adjust myself to the next international phase that's going to arrive because I think that just would mean that I'm risking, um, uh, I'm risking losing my voice to, to, the, to the changes of political climate and also I'm, um, I'm risking compromising um, over political matters for human rights. And no matter how politicized the human rights as a subject matter has become in the world, I choose to believe that it is it stands much beyond politics, and that um, for myself, I define the role of um, always defending human rights. We have groups um, sometimes of advocates um, in today's Iran that say because Iran is at a risk of a war or because of international sanctions, um, or the uh, sanctions against Iran. Um, and so on. We have to stay quiet about the situation that's happening on the ground. I strongly disagree. I don't think talking about what's happening on the ground is an invitation for a war. I think talking about what's happening on the ground is simply talking about what's happening on the ground and elevating the voices of grassroots advocates who are risking their lives every day. And they have been risking their lives before this situation uh, of the international um, climate, um, liking Iran or disliking Iran, and they're going to continue. So I think we have to let them lead the way. And uh, letting them lead the way, in my opinion, is consistency and um, continuity in our narrative. So that's where I choose to stand. I see you both are nodding. Is there anything you'd like to add? Well, related to the stability, for me, as I've seen it in the last couple of years, for Europe, stability in Syria is 
having no refugees coming from Syria to your country, whether they're actually being droned in the Mediterranean, kept in the neighboring countries, or killed inside Syria. So that is the stability that I've seen, um, whether um, in the events where the, the politicians um, are saying, or even like in, in many of the media outlets that I could read. Um, for, for me, it is really scary that many are now thinking that the war has ended in Syria, and it is time to brightwash Assad and keep the relationships, putting uh, Syria back on the Arab League, um, like as if nothing has happened, but there is something that happened, and you can't really run away from it. Um, yesterday, um, two days ago, I had an event with um, the FCO, the British Foreign Ministry, and they were speaking about Syria and that we, we don't think about opening an embassy or whatever. And I was like, but you know, you have a, a very unique, high-profile British person who is still in Syria, and unlike like Shamima, um, she also went to Syria. She also got married to a war criminal who is being recognized as a war criminal. Um, she is advocating for that war criminal, and she is the first lady. So while the British government is stripping off like this um, brides of ISIS from their nationalities, no one is speaking about her because she's good looking, she's tall, she's British educated. Sadly, many of the European countries are still dealing with Syria the same way. We know many of those who are from the security forces, like the head of the air forces, even traveled freely to, to Italy. Many of them are coming for shopping for here because they have sanctions to do things online. While the regular Syrian, or someone like me who's advocator, who's known, who's working for an international organization, we always get stripped from the queues, put on the side, interrogated. This system is really very contradicting for me. Like, I, I, I don't really understand it. To conclude, I think there is not going to be any kind of stability, neither in Syria or anywhere in the region, without justice, without accountability, without some kind of solutions for all those refugees who many of them would really come back when they know that they're not going to be arrested on the ways their house are going to be returned to them after being stripped out of them or destroyed. So you can get rid of us by allowing us to go back. Yeah, with us, I mean, with Yemen, nobody is really bothered by the war in Yemen because we're still seen, we're not categorized as a refugees. We're more like heading guests um, I would not say few doors are open for Yemenis, N not really. Maybe when you reach to Europe, then you're able to seek asylum. But for Yemenis, they like when the war started, they went out, they stayed for like one year, two years, and then they had to go back and and you know and face death because they have no other option. So nobody's bothered by the Yemeni war. Um, we're not sending out refugees. So things are fine with them. It will continue. So you have stability. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It depends how you define no. it, I guess. <laughs> and for who is also like stability for who, right? Yes. Not necessarily for the people for in Yemen. Warlords. Is there anyone who wants to ask uh, some questions? Could, uh, there's one on the front row. Uh, thank you. I think you will actually have a mic if you want one. Uh, thank you to all three of you um, for everything that you're doing and how extraordinary the, even the way you told your stories has been tonight. Um, Yasmina, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about the women's delegation. Um, how have you gone about identifying who would participate? Uh, you mentioned that there's a very clear and strong sense of what is needed. <laughs> um, if they would just be asked, so I'm not asking you to go through all of it, but could you maybe share some of the things that um, this delegation is advocating for? Um, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about it, if you don't mind. Yeah, so um, we went to Geneva last time. It was before Stockholm. Um, so at that time, it was the Peace Track Initiative only delegation, which I was leading. And the thing is that we were um, not allowed to be in the uh, official venue for the talks, but uh, we were able to conduct uh, sideline meetings with um, um, you know, with all international actors and ambassadors, we were uh, free to convey the messages of the Yemeni women who were in the ground. Because uh, before that, we did some consultations with Yemeni women, uh, in which we had like um, groups called uh, uh, 
uh, peace circles. Uh, we discussed thematic areas and solutions. And then we had to go uh, to Geneva to meet with, with all the um, actors and to share with them these messages and, you know, and consultations. So um, at that time there, we were trying to support uh, the women advisory group to the UN special envoy because they didn't really have the freedom that we had, you know, to go and talk. They were a little bit protected. So um, it was this support to them. It was also um, our role to call for our right to be at this peace negotiation table. Afterwards, when we came back, I'm a co-founder of uh, Women Solidarity Network. It's a network that um, um, has um, 300 women on board. Um, we, we try now, we are trying to do like a small election by calling the women who are interested to be among this delegation, which could start from eight to 16 women, and then by sharing their bios or CV or you know, there will to be uh, among this delegation. We will do this election by giving all the 300 women the right to vote. And then maybe this could be somehow a very strategic um, um, approach to have women representation. Um, yes, and we're waiting for this coming uh, uh, peace talks. It's, we will have them and, and we really hope to have the support of all the internationals to just to, to uh, I mean, to make this happening soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any other questions? There's one on the side here. Hi there. I'm uh, Annette Groth. I'm a, a foreign news uh, journalist here in Norway. Been abroad a lot, though, to some of your countries. But um, I wondered... I I was asking, I wanted to ask Zaina because uh, I was on the other side when you and uh, the citizen journalists uh, did all your footage. It all came to Reuters and, you know, all the big agencies and they sent it out and it was so important. And I admired all those people who went out there uh, in dangerous conditions. And it was such... Um, an important corrective to the government uh, information coming out. Uh, so I just wanted to say that, how important it was for us to try and give a correct picture of what was going on in Syria. But you were talking about Assad and Asma Assad and uh, the British educated uh, people. And uh, I just want to ask you, can you see any future for Syria that you could accept with Bashar al-Assad still as the president? Um, certainly no. Like, he is a war criminal. I can't see any future of Syria unless he is in the ICC being really in a trial for committing all these crimes. At least him as a person, if we're not speaking about all those groups who were working with him, and certainly from the other side, from the rebel side, whoever is committing crime. Um, I think the justice is the main reason, is, is the main thing that would allow any of us to go back. Otherwise, it's going to be staying as it is. Not to mention that I think Assad himself is not in control of Syria anymore. He's, he's really in control of Russia and Iran. And we're seeing plenty of footage where he's being guided to stand behind Putin or he's not being allowed to get in next to him while they are on the Syrian lands. So for me, at least for me, my family, and all of those who I know who started the uprising in 2011, as long as he is in power, that means Syria is not safe for any of us to go back. Um, it's not going to be stable at any time soon because obviously there is no will to put him on trial. But can you envisage, envisage what justice would be? Taking criminals into court? All of them. <laughs> or? I don't Thank think there is an or. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any more questions? We have time for some more. Yes. Um, hi, um, I'm Dr. Hala Abdul Wahab. I'm from the Kingdom of Bahrain. Um, I'd first like to thank all of you for sharing your very um, touching experiences with us. It does make a high difference for, for us if we get to see something from the eye of the people who are actually there rather than rely on the media and whatever is um, 
uh, brought to us. Um, when I first came across the seminar title, uh, Women's Voices Changing the Middle East, I was very intrigued to know what could be said and what could be shared, um, being a Middle Eastern woman myself. And um, I must tell you that you have exceeded any expectations that I had and that I really admire and I'm in awe of all your um, activities and, and, and your strength and resilience, and you are definitely role models. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, comments are uh, comments are also welcome, especially press. Um, any other questions? We still have time for a few more. No, no questions. Yes, one question. Let's go. Do you want to give her a mic? Zaina, not to put you on the spot, but I just love so much of what you're saying, and I'm just going to have to ask you again. Um, but um, there was a bit of what you were discussing in, ter in terms of asthma and also the way that there's a bit of a double standard in how folks are being treated and what does that really signify. What are a few, you know, two to three, if you will, like advocacy items that you would be pushing for with some countries in the West that purport to care about um, human rights issues yet are sort of enforcing these types of double standards and things like that. I, I just be, would be curious to know what sort of advocacy um, positions you're, you're pushing for or any, any of your colleagues are. I think the first one, which is not really very much related to Europe, but the first one would be um, the Syrian detainees, um, even of those kidnapped. Uh, now, as ISIS is decreasing from Syria, for example, no one is really asking where are those who are kidnapped by ISIS. And the Syrian detainees who are thousands, hundreds of thousands, no one is really asking about them, despite the fact that Caesar pictures and all of those proofs has been um, really published, exhibited, and spread all over Europe. But those detainees are very much neglected, and we just heard one of hundreds of thousands of stories. Um, None of the Syrian people that I know uh, but have someone who is in prison and they don't know whether they're killed or not. Like even the, the ability to put a conclusion to the story that they have been killed or have a certificate or a, a thumb, those are all not feasible. So I think for me, I, the first priority, I think pressuring Assad, pressuring whoever have force on Assad, like Russia, whatever, to at least, if you don't want to get the detainees out, at least tell their families, their beloved ones, whether they're dead or alive, where they are. Like, just fighting to know this very, like, fighting to know whether your son is dead is not really a great um, deal of information, but this is very essential and it will make an ending um, for a very difficult stories. Um, the second thing, I think, especially now, I think uh, the UK has declared that this year is freedom of expression, and I was like, you are encouraging people to take this amount of risk to defend freedom of expression and to be independent. What would you do if they got in risk? And I just mentioned Ra'ed and Ahmad and plenty of others. Well, they're certainly not going to be giving them any visas because Syrians' visas to the UK, even those who are living in, in Europe, are declined visas into the UK because we're not sure that you're going to go back. You reach the heaven, so it's impossible to leave. Um, <laughs> N no uh, insurance if they got killed, shot, nothing for their families if they got arrested. Even if they immigrated, there is no way that they can arrange for internship, for giving them chances to be able to build themselves. So you're encouraging for human rights? At least protect those who are putting their lives on risk to defend those human rights. You want to defend human, uh, uh, freedom of expression? protect those who are defending freedom of expression. Or at least do not humiliate them, do not confiscate their passports, do not put them on the checkpoints, do not ban them from traveling into your countries. So detainees, human rights defenders, and I special emphasize on those women because as we all spoke about, they do have extra difficulties that they're facing because they're women and they need extra support. Some messages to the whole international community, including Norway there. Um, I guess, is there any other things that you would like to add towards the end? For example, uh, what can the international community do, or even Norway, since we are in Norway here now, to support the kind of work that you guys are doing better? You want to start? <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, uh, I tried to highlight it in my speech. Um, I don't know what can be done, but I think that um, there needs to be more and more um, uh, 
work done on, on political prisoners, and I, I come from Iran. Iran is why my heart beats, but this is really for like the region and the world. And um, I think if you create a country, it will be a country of political prisoners. So think about that country and care for it and their families and their communities. And um, my, also my request to all of us, including myself that sometimes falls for this, um, don't think of all these very brave human beings and their families as poster children and as victims. Um, there is agency in there, there is choice in there, there is courage in all of those stories. So please, um, when you help to raise awareness about the situation, um, think of them as um, uh, your own people. Um, and not, um, not, not people and families and individuals in, in some far place in the world where you know, they are poor and they have nothing and, and you know, they're sad. I promise you, we, can, we are happy when we're allowed to, <laughs> and even when we're not allowed to. So I think, I think that, please don't forget um, political prisoners and their families, and um, don't take away um, our agency while you fight for our rights. Do you want to add something? Um, I think the support, um, whether mental, advocating, raising awareness, sadly, after eight years of the Syrian conflict, we still need to say that. Um, at the beginning, it was ISIS against the, the Assad, and now it's like everything is stable. There is always those kind of things which tell you that Syria is out of the map. It is not. And now you have plenty of Syrians that are very close to you. Um, instead of speaking about Syrians, speak with Syrians. It's, it is very easy. Um, ask them what they want you to do. Um, it's also not that difficult. And just, I think, as, uh, as they said, um, put faces and stories. Um, they didn't come to steal your money or taxes. They really came because they couldn't handle it more and they might be able to go back. If your government and the other governments has pressured for some kind of justice and st actual stability to be happening in their countries. Jasmine? Yeah, from my side, I, I think I said it all, but um, maybe to um, have more women to the Norway and, and here, empower them by creating spaces for them, by making their voices um, strong, and also um, shift on the humanitarian aid into development. It's good to combine development with the, to combine development with the with the humanitarian aid because. Yemenis have enough resources, but they need really to sustain this by, you know, um, thinking about development, which will um, provide them with an income uh, rather than joining fighters and others. So, so this could be one great approach. And for the women, you know, just more protection programs, more, you know, spaces. Yes, that's all. Hopefully, one such space was uh, created here tonight. Yes. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, you're the one who's creating this space together with us. Thank you to everyone who came tonight. Um, and I will give Ingwil the last word. Um, but uh, happy Women's Day tomorrow. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it you to said you. No. You said thank you. You said happy Women's Day. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank um, the Also Women's Rights Initiative and Miriam and Asma especially for bringing all these fantastic women here. And uh, we we won't let you leave without giving you this. Uh, these are uh, the Nobel Peace Prize chocolates. <laughs> I I'm not able to give you the ones in gold, unfortunately. <laughs> But these are quite good, actually, <laughs> and you really deserve them. Um, and thank you for giving us, uh, and you have one too. Uh, it's been an excellent warm-up for uh, Women's Day tomorrow, and I just want to inform you that uh, at the Nobel Peace Centre we will um, rally under the slogan uh, Stop Sexual Violence in War and Conflict, as it is related to this year's uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, if you are uh, in Oslo tomorrow, uh, please come and join us, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.